All right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, web panels, multi-stage paneling, and a whole bunch of other ones. So there's a whole, this sort of is going to encompass a whole bunch of different uh, methods for doing things. So I'm going to talk about all of them sort of very quickly uh, and as an overview. And again, I think part of the purpose of these presentations when we give them a Statistics Canada is to get the participants in our presentations to, to have heard these concepts so that if they're in meetings or if they're if they're asked to do more work on it, they will at least have heard the concept and they know it exists and they'll have sort of a, a basic introduction to it so that um, when, they're, when they're in their work environment and someone says this to them, they'll say, okay, yeah, I remember what this is. I have an idea of what it is, but it doesn't really give you enough knowledge to do any work in it. You have to sort of go at your own pace to find other means of learning this stuff. At Statistics Canada, we have tons and tons of courses. It's one of the things that we're very well known for in the government. Um, so this is a, it's, this comes from part of our brief introduction or it's a, actually a long introduction, but to many, many, many things. So it's not very deep. So let's, let's get into it. Um, as with all my presentations, I like to start with uh, some bad math. So uh, in this, this example, I'm gonna talk about some forecasting and prediction. So, um, Tracy set up a Slido for this one, but I'll read it out first. So if the score is two to one in a, at halftime, what is our expected outcome in a game? So this could be, let's say football or soccer. And now what happens when a team scores six seconds into an hour long game? What is the expected uh, outcome in that game? All right, so uh, yeah, as we see from this, I let, I put in, normally I just put the, the potential scores. So you're right, what's the expected outcome? You know, no one can really predict what's gonna happen. Uh, but when we talk about forecasting and modeling, we're sort of saying based on the evidence we have already, what's gonna happen. And so if I, if I force people to answer this question, if I left it just numbers, um, four to two would be sort of the expected outcome because we played half the game, one team has managed to score two and one team has managed to score one. So if we double the amount of time, we would expect it to be four to two, but again, Anyone who's answered, no one can predict or no one should predict, you know, I'll give them a little bit of uh, leeway here. Now, this one, number two, if someone scores six seconds into an hour long game, this means if they continue to score at this rate, they'll score 10 times in 60 seconds or 600 times in an hour. So the one person that answered 600 to nothing, you have correctly predicted this. Um, now, I, um, the reason I like to talk about this one is because um, I work with the University of Ottawa basketball teams and, and football teams, and we used to have the internet people, the internet broadcasters sit right beside the, stat the statisticians, which were me, and I used to do this to them. So if someone scored sort of six seconds in, um, I would slide them over a piece of paper saying that this person's on pace for, now we only played 48-minute uh, games, so I would say they were on pace for 480 points. And at the start, they would always be really excited. Like the, when they first started working with us, they were always really excited when I was sliding them over notes with statistics on it. And then they basically said like, stop sending us statistics in the first minute because we know what you're doing. You're multiplying it by some bizarrely big number. Um, so those are sort of the, the potential outcomes. Now, I did not, oh, there we go. So now the question is, would anyone recognize what this is? So. This is the expected outcome by minute for the last Super Bowl. And that's why I asked Tracy earlier if she was a fan of uh, the NFL football. Um, this was the expected outcome per points uh, per minute. So we see that as they score, it sort of spikes up. And as time goes on, the expected outcome goes down until they score again, and then it starts to go down again. So um, this was Kansas City and Tampa Bay. Uh, Tampa Bay was never really in any fear of losing this one. But while I've been teaching this, I sort of update this slide every year for different NFL games, uh, Super Bowls. What I found while I was doing some research was this, and this to me is just uh, incredible. So what this is, there's this thing called uh, NFL Fast R, which is a, an add-on to the R programming language where you can put in a bunch of parameters. So who, what teams they're playing, what yard line they're on, what down it is, and it will tell you the predicted win probability for every single position on the field at every single minute of the game. You can just change this parameter and say, they're on the 20 yard line, they're on the 50 yard line, the score is currently this, and R will predict the, the outcome for you of the game. And um, I thought I was sort of really into predicting numbers. Uh, the people that put this data in 
So what they basically did was they threw in every single NFL game from the season and they let it model the potential outcomes based on where they were. And it's just incredible to me that they did this. Um, here's an example of people using data from longer or shorter periods, depending on what it is that they're trying to achieve. So this is carbon dioxide concentrations in, um, in this observatory in Mauna Loa, I think it's in Hawaii. And they were looking at carbon dioxide emissions. And so this is two years over May uh, in around 2013. So look at this and we can see there's a little bit of a tendency of it going upwards. But if I just presented this to you and said, it's seasonal, it changes by the year, people might be like, oh, okay, yeah, they just changed by the year. But then if we look at it over a period of 50 years, the seasonality is still there, but you see this incredible shift upwards, which uh, is not doing us any favors. Um, so I'm just trying to get the chat back up. All right. Um, and we see this incredible change over time, uh, which is not good. Obviously, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is not good for us. Then if they go back even further and they carbon date this, so now they're using ice core samples from either the Arctic or Antarctic. And they're showing that, you know, things were pretty stable until the industrial age happened. And then it's just taken off since then. And if we look at it even going further back, we looking at over hundreds of thousands of years, there's these huge 100,000 period cycles that carbon dioxide goes through on the planet. And, you know, we're well beyond anything we've ever had. So depending on who's trying to argue what point of an argument, they can easily use very long periods of time or very short periods of time to try to reinforce what it is. When I go back to this one, at halftime, if I said there was one minute left in the game, you know, a 60 minute game, you could probably have a pretty good prediction of what the final score is going to be. People are filing to the exit. They're trying to get to their car before everyone else is done. The one that happened six seconds in, this is where it's really risky. You have one uh, six hundredth of a data of the entire data to work with. So, you know, we, we shouldn't be predicting things this early. So this is just a, some examples using forecasting stuff for bad math, not quite good math. All right, so let's go in and talk about these things. So I'm gonna talk about a whole bunch of different ones. If you have questions, please fire away with the questions. I'm more than happy to answer them and let's get through this. So again, if, if you're looking, if you know, if you work with the GSBPM, we're at 2.4 and 4.1. So we're still on the design side. So we're still designing it and we're still creating and selecting our sample. This is the way that I see it from, I mean, it's true of every survey, but I certainly see this from the Statistics Canada side. So planning and design, this falls on mine and Tracy's shoulders a lot as does treatment and outputs. So we wanna plan, we talked about this in the first presentation, we wanna plan so that when we are done this collection, which I refer to as magic and I'll talk about in a second, that we can do the treatment that has to be done to our outputs and then we can release it to the public or whoever it is that the data is going to. So I refer to collection as magic here because part of what we try to do with this introductory course at Statistics Canada is to sort of teach a level of respect for our interviewers. Um, it's easy when you sort of, you graduate from university, you've been working in theoretical stuff, you know, in university textbooks, you come to Statistics Canada, you start working with really large data sets and you sort of forget that this data comes from somewhere, that it's been collected by our interviewers and that their job is in incredibly difficult. These presentations I'm giving is part of a much longer course, which is six weeks long. And the students have to actually do collection. Prior to 2013, they did it out in the field door to door. And from 2013 until COVID, uh, they did it by phone. And to watch a really good interviewer to me is, is I call it magical um, because at least at Statistics Canada, I'm not sure if it's the same at your countries, um, we're not allowed to provide any incentive to respondents because providing respondents incentives can introduce biases. If people are, um, let's say we offer them $10 to complete one of our surveys, it may encourage people that need $10 to reply to our surveys more than other people. So um, it also incurs a bigger budget if we're trying to collect 60,000 households and we give them $10 each. I mean, that's $600,000 a month just for that survey. So obviously there's a cost involved. We want to do that either. But watching a really good interviewer do their job, I consider magical. And when we talk about response rates, you know, someone may say, you know, the survey only had a response rate of 60%. That still means that three out of every five people that they contact were willing to do the survey. And to me, when three out of five people give you their time, that's impressive. 
I understand there's difficulties with the fact there might be bias introduced by this, but it's still an impressive feat to be able to get that much information from people uh, voluntarily. So the first thing I want to talk about in this presentation is multi-stage sampling. So this is the process of sele selecting a sample at two or more successive stages. And you can put in as many stages as you like. Obviously, the more stages you put in, the more complicated this gets. But um, this is multi-stage sampling. So I've got a little um, hierarchy here. So the first thing you need to do is you need to create a list of the primary sampling units, PSUs, and select from that list. And then from the secondary sampling units, you can create a list and select from there. And that will get you down to tertiary and whatever the word is for four and five, you can collect from that as well. Um, I've, seen, I've seen scientific research that's gone down to even if it's um, doing something like uh, testing out different creams, for example, a, a medical treatment, they'll randomly select the left arm and right arm of people and say, put cream A on your left arm and put cream B on your right arm and do this every day so that the, the opposite arm can be the control for the, the other arm. And so this is, an, is still an example of multi-stage sampling. They're sampling all the way down to which arm they're selecting. So you can, you can break this up anyway. Now, what's interesting about this, and we're going to see this in a couple slides, is that only those that are selected do you need to have a frame, a potentially have a frame for. So if I select uh, cities in Canada, for example, or neighborhoods, I only have to have detailed information for that city. I don't have to have detailed information for all of Canada. And that's, we're going to see this. This is impossible to read. And that's fine because I'm going to show you the important part. These are letters that we send out to respondents now. Uh, when the first kind of contact is by mail, we send them this. This is the important part. So this is the self-selection letter. So this is how people, when we contact for, for example, labor force survey, our first stage of sampling for labor force survey is clusters. We talked, we saw that last week. So the first level of, collect, of collection is um, just a geographical area. A neighborhood uh, is another way to call it here in Canada. We'll sample a neighborhood. And then from there, the second stage, now we need detailed lists of all of the dwellings that are in these selected areas. From there, we then select households. Within that household, we now, uh, for labor force, anyone can answer, but for this survey specifically, um, you need to select a respondent inside the household. So the primary sampling unit is uh, the cluster or the neighborhood. The secondary sampling unit is the dwelling or household. And then the tertiary unit is this person. So they're trying to select someone from the household. So if you live alone, you're selected. That, that's obvious. It's a, it's a census of your household at that point. If you have two or more members, the oldest has been selected. Now, they alter this letter to different, um, let's say they send out 60,000 of these letters, they'll switch this up. So it'll say oldest in half of them and youngest in the other half. And in the third example here, if you have three or more household members, they'll put the oldest, they'll put the three oldest first, and then they'll just, again, these letters will say the first person, the second person, or the third person has been selected. And that's the way it does it. So it randomly selects people. The reason we stick to the top three is because it becomes much more complicated for these letters. If we say one, two, or three, if we had another one that said, if there's four members do this, it's going to start to get complicated for the people reading the letter. And there's sort of a belief at Statistics Canada that if you have large households, typically what's going to happen at the bottom of the list is going to be um, young adults. So either uh, the kids that are still living at home or maybe people that have just started working uh, in their early 20s. So a lot of their answers are going to be similar to um, potentially the third person. So there, it introduces a slight bit of bias there, but the trade-off is for the ease of use for the respondent. If we make the letter too complicated, the respondents just won't answer our survey at all. So here's, here's an example of what multi-stage sampling can look like. In this thing, we have eight clusters. We've selected three of them. For the three that are selected, I've sort of drawn these lines in it to say we need to know detailed information of it. And then from in each side of those, from each of those clusters, we've selected a certain number of, if these are households, they're households. The circles can represent absolutely anything. So that's how multi-stage sampling works. It's sampling at various stages. This makes waiting a little bit more difficult because Every time we do a sample, you have to keep track of the probability of inclusion for everyone. And from there, we can drive weights. But that's a presentation that we're going to see later on in April. So here's an example of a two-stage cluster. So um, they just want the municipal government wants to do a survey on the public's view of something that they're planning in the community. 
uh, creating a new park, building a new bridge, whatever it might be. So the first stage they do is they're going to select city blocks and they're going to select every hundredth city block. So if they have a list of all the city blocks in their city, um, they could do a systematic sample like we saw in the previous weeks where they just skip through the list and they select every hundredth block. And then they can say, okay, once a block has been selected, we want the interviewers to go around and they're going to select every fifth household. And that's there we've done a one in 100 selection of the city blocks. We've done a one in five selection of dwellings. And if we look down at the bottom, I've sort of multiplied this out. The chance of any one dwelling being selected is one in 500. Uh, here's a three stage one. This is a farm expenditure survey in Canada. And so we have these things called enumeration areas, which again are just geographical units in Canada. We divide these when it's farming, we can divide these up into segments, which again are just geographical areas. And then we randomly select farms from there. And here, in the previous slide, I, I fixed the number. It was one in 100 and one in five. Here, I can set whatever probability I want. The enumeration areas might be done probability proportional to size, like we saw last week. So depending on the size, there's a different chance of being selected. And then again, the segments may be different sizes within an enumeration area. We keep track of that with P2. And the chance of a farm being selected is done with P3. So that's this is how this is done. We just multiply P1 by P2 by P3. And this gives us the probability of any one farm in our country being selected or in whatever, wherever this area is. Okay, so what are the advantages? This is gonna be statistically way more efficient than a one stage cluster design. Um, a cluster sampling is where you select like a, a city block and you have to do every single dwelling in there. And there's a lot of drawbacks to that. Um, we, again, I've mentioned this, we don't need to have a list frame for the entire population. It's only for those secondary and tertiary selected ones where we have to have a full list. It's much more complex to do, but you know we all work at our statistical offices because of the complexity of the work that we're doing. If we made this, if we reduced all the complexity to zero, uh, many of us would have to be looking for different jobs. It's the complexity of those projects that have so many people working in our offices. So complexity, despite being a disadvantage in multi-stage sampling, can be seen as an advantage for most of us. Here's another example, so labor force survey. Here's an example of how um, large a project um, this can be. So 60,000 households in Canada are selected uh, every month. It's a five stage rotation. So really we only select 10,000 new dwellings each month, but we stratify, we talked about stratification last week. We go Canada province insurance in uh, employment insurance region, which is just a government program that helps out um, regions of Canada that have difficulty with employment. So there's different programs in place there. From there, we will split them into urban, rural, and remote. And we have definitions of these depending on population densities. Uh, we have major urban and other urban. And we'll also create other frames. So example, we may have a, an apartment frame for apartment buildings. When we have enumerators or interviewers that go around in neighborhoods, it's very usually very easy to see if a house is occupied. There's some sort of indication, there's a car in the driveway, there's curtain in the windows, uh, the mail is being collected. You'll know that someone lives there. If you're in front of an apartment building and the apartment building has 100 units in it, it's impossible for the interviewer or the enumerator to stand in front of it and to know uh, how many people are there, live there. So uh, we call these things apartment frames. Because of the Statistics Act in Canada, we can contact the management companies of these buildings and they're required by law to provide us the list of all the occupied dwellings. So um, it, when the enumerators are out on their own, they'll interview with the apartment frames, they send it back to head office and head office deals with it for them. And again, for labor force, we, I talked about these clusters, we have these clusters, we select the dwelling, and then within the dwelling, we can select a selected responder if we need to. Because labor force allows proxy answers, which we saw in the first week, which is anyone in the house can answer for anyone else, we don't need to select at this stage. At this stage, we just need anyone who's knowledgeable about the the labor conditions of the people in the household to answer the questionnaire. Okay, next thing I'm gonna talk about is replicated sampling. Replicated sampling is used to estimate variance. So the most common ways people hear about this is bootstrap and jackknife. Bootstrap is much, much, much more common. So almost all of the variances at Statistics Canada are estimated using bootstrap variance estimations. From what I've heard from one of my students, there's exactly one survey at Statistics Canada that still uses jackknife. What happened was um, at the very start of sort of estimation of variances, when we started using these things, um, <clears throat> surveys were sort of working on their own, trying to figure out which method they want to use. 
one of them grabbed jackknife. It was a long process to sort of uh, put this in to be able to run it properly. And it works very well for them. So they haven't transitioned over to bootstrap and the estimates that they're getting with jackknife are just as good as bootstrap. So there's no need to force them into changing it. So there's one survey at Statistics Canada that uses jackknife and all the rest use bootstrap. And so what we're gonna do, I, I have a picture of this. The way bootstrap sampling works is we have this thing that we consider the superpopulation. So the superpopulation can be, for example, the population of your entire country. We don't know the age distribution. We don't know the income distribution. We don't know anything. This is why we're conducting our survey. So what we do is we draw a sample. So let's say labor force survey, we sample 60,000 dwellings. This sample, we now consider this to be our population. We've gone down and we say, okay, let's pretend these 60,000 uh, people that we've interviewed are our population. What happens if we subsample some of this in, in this population? So we'll draw samples outside of it. Ah, so someone's asked me to remind people about the difference between multi-stage and multi-phase sampling. Multi-phase sampling is actually coming up in this presentation. So uh, I'll sort of reinforce it there. But yeah, it's a very good point that multi-stage and multi-phase are two different types of sampling and they can be confusing since they both start with multi and what's a phase and what's a stage. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So here, uh, again, we're drawing, if I draw 60,000, we'll then take our 60,000. And for example, uh, with Bootstrap, what we do is we subsample from within there. And we look at, okay, what's the variability of the estimates? So from these, let's say we have 60,000 respondents, which is great. They may have like 60,000 different incomes. We'll take a subsample of that and say, what's the estimated average income based on the sample we took? And we'll do this over and over and over again. And then we'll look at the distributions of the possible answers. And this will give us an estimate of the sampling error for our survey. With Jackknife, what they do, if I understand right, is they, they take the 60,000, they take the first observation out, and they run the estimate on the other 59,999. Then they put that one back in, they take the second estimate out, and they do this 60,000 times, which is why it isn't very popular, because uh, it takes a lot of computing power to do that one. And Bootstrap will get you just as good an answer. Okay, why do we use replicated sampling? So from the client point of view, there's no difference. This is done once the data has come in house. This isn't a sampling technique to go out and sample respondents. This is a sampling technique to estimate our variance. So this is something that people are um, very uncomfortable with uh, when they usually first come to Statistics Canada because this isn't taught at our universities. It may be mentioned, but it's not something that they don't, well, they may now, but I don't, I still don't think they do. They don't teach estimation of variance. If you're taking a statistics program in Canada, they'll teach you how to calculate variance sort of from a theoretical point of view. So people come in and they're like, what is this bootstrap? And especially if you're not a methodologist like Tracy and I, you hear this even less frequently. And so this can become sort of upsetting might be the right word. If you're hearing this at meetings all the time, you don't know what it is. So it's just a way for us to calculate um, an estimator of the precision of the, the answer. It's very quick. We can, we can actually start to do this even before all the estimates come in. We don't need, we don't do this normally, but you can. Um, the estimates of our precision are gonna be slightly less precise than those calculated with more uh, advanced methodological systems. And this is actually done on purpose because, uh, sorry, there can, we do this conservatively is what I should say we do on purpose. If we think we have that the average age is 40 and our standard error is four, and we calculate this directly from the data using you know, very advanced methodological systems, with bootstrap or jackknife, we'll get a slightly wider variance. It might come back at something like 4.1. And we'd rather have a much a, cons a bigger value, a more conservative estimate, so that we're right, so that the variance resides in that smaller estimate. OK, here's multi-phase sampling. So again, thanks to the person who wanted me to point this out. Um, multi-phase sampling, this is done at multiple steps over time. So multi-stage can be done relatively instantaneous. I can pick um, city blocks in a community and then I can immediately go out and select households in those blocks and I can immediately interview the person in that house that I've, I've selected. Multi-phase talks about more, um, multi-phase talks about more of there's a time component. What's going to happen is data is going to come in, you're going to analyze the data potentially and then subsample from these units. And we'll talk about this for the next uh, few minutes. So here's sort of a graphical representation that someone put in. So here we sampled seven units, whatever they are, 
households, people, businesses, doesn't matter. For whatever reason, they've selected to do a more detailed interview of four of them. They're the ones with Solid Blue. And for three of them, uh, once they've collected the preliminary data, they don't do any more data collection after that. So they just let them go. Why do we use this? So the frame may lack information to permit stratification or to screen out a portion of the population that's not of interest to the survey. So for example, if we wanna do a survey of people that, have, uh, that own a car, that might be a one to do. If we don't have a car registration list and we just do random digit dialing, um, we're gonna to have to have some sort of screening question or it, more precisely, we may want to do it. Um, we may want to do a much more detailed one. We may want to do, sorry, we may want to do an intro survey where it's do they own the car? Um, you know, what kind of insurance do they have? How many kilometers do they drive a year? There might be all this baseline information, sort of 20 questions we want to ask them. And then we collect this baseline information. And then once we have this information, we may want to go back and contact them and say, okay with you because of certain characteristics you drive more than you know 3000 kilometers a year we now want to collect some more information from you how much do car repairs cost uh, do you you know do people pay you for travel things like that so there's a subset of questions we want everyone to answer and then we want more detailed answer from a certain um, subset of the population and this might be too heavy a response burden for all respondents so farming is a really good example of this we don't ask um, every farmer, every crop type. So in Canada, we have the census of agriculture. Anyone who owns a farm that makes at least, I think it's a thousand dollars a year has to answer the census of agriculture. We then collect that. And if we're doing a follow-up survey, if we're doing a survey on wheat, for example, or what's the wheat production in Canada, we now have on our census of agriculture, all of the wheat farms. And then we can focus either through, um, we could do uh, a census where we talk to every wheat farmer or we can do some sort of sampling method where they've answered all these baseline questions. We know they're a farm. We know they've made more than $1,000 a year. We know that they uh, produce wheat. So then we can go back and ask them much more detailed questions. So that's an example of multi-phase sampling. I said this before and I'll say it again. I always put the word can in here because I have to, but you can just replace the word can with will. This will greatly in in increase the precision of our survey estimates. We're now able through two phases, through an initial interview and a secondary interview. And again, you can have more phases, you can have more phases if you want. It's gonna in greatly increase the precision of our survey estimates because we're now gonna speak to directly to the kind of uh, target audience that we're really looking for, target population. Uh, so this can be used to obtain auxiliary information that's not in sampling frame. So again, we collected from everyone at the start, we get a little bit of information from them. And it can be used when the cost of collecting for some of the survey variables is particularly expensive. So let's say we actually need to do something like draw blood. We want to make sure we're really talking to the population that has, say, the health effect that we're looking for before we start drawing blood from everyone and then asking them, you know, do you have diabetes, for example? If our population is mobile or the characteristic request changes over time, this can cause a problem. So the example I like to use here is if we're doing interviews of school children, and let's say we're targeting students that are in grade five, we can't go out our school year in Canada is from September to June. We can't go out in May, do a preliminary survey of grade five students, and then try to come back three or four months later because these students are no longer in grade five, they'll be in grade six. So there's issues with multi-phase sampling where time, the time component might cause you problems, but it's something you just have to build into the way that you're doing your survey. Okay, so now we're going to get into much more modern stuff or much more like cutting edge uh, stuff. And I would argue that some of this stuff is actually sort of controversial. The stuff that we've been doing at StatsCan for decades and decades, no one really questions. This stuff comes up and you're going to find uh, various different camps at work where some of them like this and some don't. Um, the only thing is, is that, you know, publicly facing, you know, we will put out you know, everyone sort of agrees with it in the public facing. We put a lot of um, footnotes and warnings on stuff like this. So what is crowdsourced data? Crowdsourced data is an open survey where participation is sent out through social media. So um, we will send out information through all of our social medias and through various other channels. And we'll say, we're collecting data on X and people then can decide if they wanna participate in the survey. 
we have no control over who enrolls in the survey. And that's part of the difficulty with crowd surfing, crowd surfing, crowd sourcing. We can't do inferential statistics. Um, it's very, very difficult. So what we, when we do these things, instead of saying percentage of Canadians, so when we're doing labor force survey, which is a traditional survey, we can say 8.3% of Canadians were unemployed last month. When we do crowdsource surveys, you can only talk about percentage of respondents or respondents from this survey answer the following. So it's very much more detailed down into the people that were willing to provide answers for us. This is the analysis we did on their data. At Statistics Canada, we've only been doing this for ooh, several years, maybe. I feel like it's three or four years. The way that this started was actually very interesting. So Canada legalized marijuana consumption or cannabis consumption a few years ago. Tracy can pipe in if she remembers. Let, to make life easy, we'll say three years ago. So Statistics Canada had this problem where all of a sudden the Charter of National Accounts was going to include this new um, crop, which is marijuana or cannabis, I should say. Um, and it's, so it's going to include the farming. It's going to include the, the production, the sale, the distribution. All of a sudden, we have this new component into the system of national accounts that is appearing from, the, from nowhere. These <laughs> consumption, sales, production, all of the stuff already exists on the black market. We have channels in place to try to estimate black market consumption of goods for the system of national accounts. But when we're adding something actually to the system of national accounts on the legal side, they really want to get a good idea of what is the consumption out there? What are the prices that are people paying? And so they did this thing called, it was called Stat Cannabis. And they put it out in the media and Canadians were fairly into the idea of, oh my gosh, you know, the cannabis is becoming legal. It was sort of a hot topic. People sort of enjoy talking about because it it's a little bit cheeky. And so we got a lot of responses to this. Um, a lot of people were willing to provide, you know, their frequency of consumption, the price that they pay. And Statistics Canada sort of would publish this frequently to sort of um, encourage people to, um, uh, so this would encourage people to answer the survey and people got really excited about it. So we put out more crowdsourcing type um, surveys uh, more recently. So COVID was a big one. COVID hits, this, our period of collection was last year, April 3rd. So March 13th in Canada, everything got shut down. There was a stay at home order. Um, everyone got locked down. And so again, people were very interested in this. So you'll see we got 250,000 people answering the survey. It was a very big deal. It got sent around by social media and people sort of saw it as patriotic to be answering this, right? So Canada's trying to figure out what on earth is going on. They can't figure it out what's going on if people aren't telling them. So a lot of people were, were um, comfortable answering this. Post-secondary students, we did another survey of them last year. We had about 100,000 respondents. And you'll see it gets sort of much smaller down there, like trust in others, parenting during the pandemic. Again, with crowdsourcing, these are sent out through um, our social media channels. And we sort of hope that people share this on Facebook or retweet it so that we get more and more responses for it. All right, so we have these things that are called web panels. And web panels can be confused with crowdsourcing. And I'm going to talk about them. Web panels exist and have existed for a long time. So an existence of a web panel is if you sign up to do surveys on the internet, there are companies that do this. You can sign up with them and they will send you surveys sort of like every week or every month and you can answer them. So that's a web panel. So a web panel uh, can be probabilistic. It can be probabilistic. You can design it in such a way that it's unbiased because they're going to send this out and say, okay, you've been, you've signed up to do our web panel. We know who you are. We know a bit about you. We can make this sort of um, probabilistic. They have really small sample sizes by comparison. Crowdsourcing, we have no idea who's answering. Uh, it's often difficult to, to control to make sure people don't answer twice and bias might be present. And I'm gonna talk about web paneling a little bit longer. So these are pools of respondents that are available and willing to answer surveys over the internet. Um, when a data need arises, the web panelist are sent an email with a link to conduct the survey. So this is super inexpensive and you get a super quick turnaround. So, these are people that are already sort of invested in the idea that this is something they're willing to do. It's, it can, so there's some drawbacks. And then on the next slide, I'm gonna talk, how do we mitigate this stuff? So it's really easy to introduce bias for self-selection. So if anyone can sign up to be part of the web panels, 
what can happen is special interest groups can say, okay, you know, we've got 3,000 expensive car enthusiasts in Ontario, the province I live in. Um, Statistics Canada is doing a survey on car usage. Every one of our members needs to go sign up to be part of this web panel. And then you introduce this bias self-selection where everyone who's like expensive car enthusiasts end up in this web panel. And so the, the answers might be biased. All of a sudden, they don't want people taxing expensive cars, for example. Um, so like I said, the third thing, like these open web panels can be hijacked by special interest groups. We don't have those as Statistics Canada. So there's open so anyone can join and closed is invitation by invitation only. How on earth do we find people to invite to be part of web panels? We do this based on surveys they've already collected information from. So labor force survey, we sample 60,000 households. After six months, we ask people, can we please contact you in the future to do very quick surveys on, um, on topics that may be of interest to you that are definitely of interest to the Canadian population and the government. And this will be very patriotic if you do it so that we'll get this. Um, the general social survey is GSS. Uh, this is a future plan. General social survey is another very big survey at Statistics Canada. The, the nice thing about general social survey is it asks a lot of social type questions. And so they'll have a good idea of the distribution of the population and they can work from there. And then rapid stats parent panel. Uh, this one's really interesting to me. It's why we're exciting because they'll now have rapid stats as a, as a type of survey we do at Statistics Canada. One of the questions they ask is, are you a parent or not? And then they can say, okay, well, now we have this panel of parents. We have a list of all these parents. We can go and subsample back from them. Um, when you have an, a closed web panel, so we downweight overrepresented population, we upweight rep, uh, underrepresented populations. And this is something we can do if we know what our population has come from. And I'm going to talk about this really quickly. So um, with web panels, we started this thing called the Canadian Perspective Survey Series. So the web panel started in 2020. And there was these six topics. So much like our crowdsource stuff, these ones were by invitation only. But um, again, it wasn't randomly selected from the population. This came from our web panels. So 31,000 Canadians were invited to, to join these web panels. Of that, 7,200 accepted. And depending on which one of these surveys we're talking about, these six surveys, we either had about 4,000 or 4,600 uh, people reply. Now, you can get into some real discussions on the fact that the response rates were approximately 13% of those invited, uh, maybe a slightly higher than that, but um, this is, a, this is a, a, there's room for debate here. These are something that we take with a grain of salt. They're not as, Labor Force Survey has 60,000 respondents. Our other surveys have tens of thousands of respondents. These are much smaller. So there's a lot of, um, warnings that go that get put out when we produce this data and that's the end of my presentation for today